magic is just as it sounds, a chance for hands-on to celebrate what organisations and individuals and communities are doing to protect species and their habitat. And we've stretched our coverage to include stories from the bird and marine world. If you're expecting loads of low-tech thinking, think again. Many of the ideas in this programme use the latest in communication technology, so keep watching. There may be something you can do. <coughs> Samburu National Reserve in Kenya's Rift Valley, once a remote wilderness far removed from the reaches of global communications. Now, development of the mobile network means even the wildlife is getting connected. Elephants like this one called Rosemary can now send SMS text messages via the phone network. A unit with a SIM card around Rosemary's neck will transmit on the hour, every hour, her precise coordinates as a text message. This means researchers can identify and conserve areas the animals use. It also helps avoid clashes between elephants and farmers. Save the Elephants teamed up with Safaricom, a subsidiary of Vodafone, to develop the GPS GSM technology for wildlife tracking in Kenya. For the past 11 years, Ian Douglas Hamilton, leading expert on African elephant behaviour and founder of Save the Elephant Foundation, has been monitoring Samburu's 900 elephants using ever more sophisticated tracking collars. These are fastened around the animal's neck after it's been put to sleep with a tranquilizer dart. Once we get the drug in, the animal goes down, probably in three to five minutes, uh, three to seven minutes time. And once down, you can keep it down for a long time, even if you need it to be down for two hours or three hours. Here you've got a complete suite of everything that we've been using for tracking elephants, from the most primitive technology of 11 years ago, right up to the most up-to-date collars. This is an old one, which is um, just purely a beacon collar, and um, a little uh, beacon bleeps there and you can track the elephant from the air with the Yagi antenna. But the latest development needs no special antenna. It hitches a ride on the mobile phone network whenever the elephant is in range. We have another type all deployed on the elephants which uses GSM technology and that's actually our latest technology. And these use a cell telephone on the elephant to actually send text messages of the elephant's position. Out it comes an SMS message. So here's an example of a message that has come as an alert from Genghis Khan and it shows the time that this fix was taken, the latitude, the longitude. It also indicates that this this is a zone violation fix and this is a kind of message that is sent to Kenya Wildlife Service uh, patrol rangers. It can also be sent to a farmer and alert them that the elephants are coming, thus allowing him to use deterrents such as making noise to drive the elephants away and potentially avoid conflict. This is the kind of conflict that could be averted using SMS technology. It is so bad, I don't want even to look this. These elephants are literally having a field day. If they'd been spotted by the farmer, they could have been shot. As it happened, the farmer arrived after their evening feast was over and was left to repair the damage. The whole point of putting these radio collars is to establish permanent corridors so that uh, in future we go to the local communities and say, listen, this is the corridor for these animals, so maybe you have to you know, get out of this place or you know, move out of the way. So I think with the data that we're collecting from the collars, we're going to help more uh, the local communities. These elephants are completely habituated to us and they pay us the huge compliment of ignoring us. We record all their movements. Female on the right. Ah, uh, that's Grace. They know where they're safe and where's dangerous. And that, I suppose, is one of the best things that we've got out of our radio tracking study. To find out how elephants actually see the environment and to look at conservation from the perspective of elephants. With growing international terrorism, protecting the public has never been so vital. But how can security systems keep up with the ever-changing threat? Sensors, 
used to detect explosives are expensive, impractical, and can only recognize a small number of compounds at a time. A new technology being developed may be the answer. A UK company in Sentinel has found a way to harness the scent detecting abilities of the honeybee. Today's technology in sensing have reached limits uh, for sensitivity. The bees are very sensitive. Um, they can recognize the smell of flower and the whole field of flowers. Uh, we have trained them to natural smells, but as well man-made smells. And they are very sensitive. We've reached part per trillion concentration, which is extremely good. This lightweight box is a prototype. Air is sucked in through a tube, and if there's even the smallest trace of explosives, a computer readout shows positive. But the real work is being done by a team of three bees inside the box. Their antennae are constantly testing the air for chemicals. If they come across a smell they've been trained for, they stick out their tongues. This image is sent from a camera in the box to a computer that registers the bee's reaction. But how have these bees learned to recognize a man-made compound like Semtex? So in nature, the bee actually trained themselves to the smell of flowers where there is good food reward, where there is a good nectar. And so we use this ability they have to train themselves. So it's a natural learning process. The bees need one-to-one -one instruction to learn a new aroma. They're first secured in individual cradles and the cradle put in place. When a scent is blown through the pipe onto the bee, its antennae pick up tiny amounts of the sample. At the same time, the bee is given a sugar solution as a reward. In the wild, it's the same as having a drop of nectar after smelling a flower. After three or four times, the bee will stick its tongue out every time it gets wind of the smell. Basically, you can train them to any compound. So for exposures detection, we can train some bees to uh, Semtex, some to TNT, or a range of different ones, and we can have them in the same box. So basically, you could screen at an airport, for instance, uh, for a range of different exposures. It takes about three minutes to train a single bee. So a crack team of sniffer bees like this is ready for action in half an hour. Each bee has a tour of duty of up to a week in the box. Once they're finished, they're returned home. They're having a week's holiday, they're not foraging, they're not under any stress, they're just being fed occasionally. It's just a complete rest for them. Bees are cheap and easy to keep. This colony is kept in the UK all year round. You just need ultraviolet lights on a time switch, a humidifier and a heater. In the winter, bees are fed with frozen pollen and sugar water. In the summer, they're free to gather nectar in the wild. The technology has many other potential uses, with trials planned for medical diagnosis starting with tuberculosis. A lot of diseases have a, a sort of signature range of odours that are given off, um, and certainly in tuberculosis, um, somebody with pulmonary uh, TB would be giving off volatiles in the breath, and the bees would be able to give a, a very clear indication and immediate indication of whether someone had TB or not. In the future, honeybees could be the front line of defence against terrorists, drug smugglers and life-threatening diseases. Over 15,000 Hungarians are blind or partially sighted. Many of them negotiate the city with a white stick. A trained guide dog can transform the life of a blind person, providing a valuable pair of eyes. But there's a long waiting list for those who need them. If you can't see, the city can be a dangerous place. The safest way of getting around is with a dog, but this is no ordinary animal. Unfazed by crowds and traffic, Benza knows his way around the Budapest public transport system. A tram is no problem. The metro's no trouble either. Benza can get his owner, Berkey Baxi, to his eye appointment on the other side of town. <laughs> He helps me get to work, to school, to my parents. He helps me in every situation. No, I can't live without my dog. He helps me so much. But how is an excitable puppy turned into a mature and dependable partner for a blind person? It goes to school. Peter Vastalecki runs Hungary's only training school for guide dogs. 
Every working guide dog in the country has passed through here. Volunteers offer to look after suitable puppies. During the first year, they come to the school once a month, sometimes reluctantly, for a health check. When they're a year old, they start lessons. No two dogs have the same personality. It is just like a marriage. During the marriage, you get to know the other person. So that's how it works with the dogs as well. There's no template for a dog's personality. Not every dog will suit every blind person. It's very hard and very important that the right dog is chosen for the right blind person. First we have to know the height of the dog and the height of the person. We have to know whether the person is calm or not. So it's a mental and physical match. We train 20 to 25 dogs a year, but this is actually only a third of the number of dogs we need. Built under the communist regime, the training course has many of the obstacles that dogs have learned to handle, even a dummy level crossing. Here, the dogs learn to avoid potential hazards for their owners. Bertalon Hubayi is 80 years old. He's been blind for 28 years. His third guide dog has died, and he's here to meet his new friend. I had two German Shepherd dogs, both female, and the third was a Labrador, and I will receive another Labrador. The first two, the German Shepherd dogs, are not as friendly. They're really strong and they did save me, but the Labrador is a family member with a personality and they're very calm and very honest, so they are different. There's still a waiting list, but support from the Vodafone Foundation has doubled training capacity at the school, giving twice as many blind people the gift of independence. This building is home to a colony of predators that drink human blood, the leech. Historically, it was believed that bloodletting using the leech's natural thirst had great health benefits. Modern medical science dismissed the ancient practice as primitive quackery, but research is now showing the ancient medics were right and the leech is once again being seen as a medicinal tool. The leech lives in damp areas and feeds on the blood of passing animals, but its painless, blood-sucking ability is what makes it useful to doctors to help promote the flow of blood after surgery. The leech is designed for collecting blood, so when areas have got traumatised, um, so uh, say for burns, they do a skin graft and maybe the, the, the skin flap won't, won't, won't take quite as well, so you have blood underneath it. They, they use the leech then to create an artificial circulation so the area can repair itself. It bites, it feeds, takes the blood away, coats the area with a, a sort of a non-stick agent for blood. It, it delivers a flowing agent, an anti-clotting agent. They can't replicate that in modern medicine yet. Biofarm in South Wales is the first leech breeding farm in the world, producing 50,000 leeches each year. They go to all, all the burns and plastics hospitals in the UK. Literally, we supply ne nearly everywhere in the world. The leeches need an external skin to, to, to attach to, so they think they're biting on something and, and getting the, the blood through it. So it's co collagen sausage skin, just not, we just not one end. And then we just fill it with the, uh, the warm blood. They can taste that there's blood through the other side, so they, they, they will latch on and, and bite onto it. The leeches will gorge up to five times their body weight before dropping off and lolling about in a bloated state. Then they're not fed for six to nine months, so they hunger for blood when finally used in hospitals. By harnessing the natural greed of these parasites, thousands of patients have had their body parts saved. And with the growing acceptance of their medical use, many more people will benefit from the leech's bloody thirst. Switzerland, a country famous for things running like clockwork. When the Swiss began conservation of their forests, their forests were protected. 
Indeed, Swiss attempts at conservation have been so successful, many large herbivore populations are booming. It's attracted wolves from neighbouring Italy, who cross the border in search of prey. Swiss farmers have turned to a surprising ally in a bid to protect their flocks. In 1995, we had the first wolf in Switzerland again, and it came back not only because it's, it reproduces well, but also because it actually do, does find the space and the food again. The return of this predator is great news for conservationists, but not for livestock farmers. Last year there were four attacks, the first time six deaths and ten injured, second there were ten dead and twenty injured, then smaller attacks with one or two deaths. Although not a direct threat to humans, the wolf is an opportunistic hunter and livestock is a soft target. To protect their herds, some farmers are using a traditional method, large Maremma dogs. But farmers in flatter, more populated areas find a more placid animal, works better as a guard. One of the first days that the goats could, could go without a shepherd up to the mountains, a wolf uh, hit one goat and uh, he has eaten. And after this, I thought uh, I must, uh, we must uh, look for something. Uh, and there are donkeys or dogs to choose, and I preferred donkeys. A donkey will instinctively chase away dogs and wolves when it feels threatened. And it doesn't need a long period of training. After a short time getting used to being part of the flock, it'll protect them. Also big dogs, when it's coming too close to the goats, they go and, and try to hit him. For, for us, uh, it's better to work with donkeys because uh, there is uh, less danger that somebody, uh, a tourist, will be uh, beaten or hit, and uh, donkeys are quieter. It's a triumph for conservation. Whether they choose dogs or donkeys to guard their flocks, the farmers hope to live in harmony with the wolf. In upland Laos, the traditional method of farming is a shifting cultivation system that allows the land plenty of time between crops to recover nutrients. But population pressure has shortened these fallow periods. This has meant loss of soil fertility and lower yields for the already poor rice farmers. By growing grasses known as forages to feed their animals, the farmers are now discovering a new cash cow. Livestock here has traditionally been kept at subsistence level and fed on agricultural waste. A project supported by SEAT, the Centre for International Tropical Agriculture, has encouraged farmers to grow forage crops as animal feed. Its success has changed attitudes to livestock. It was only later on they actually realised that not only were they saving time, but their animals were growing quicker, they were reproducing more and they were healthier. So they changed from being keepers of livestock into being producers of livestock that they could sell and make money. The project whittled down around 600 species of potential feed crops to find seven crops best suited for feeding livestock in northern Laos. This is the guinea grass. It's very good in the wet season. They grow very fast. This is the only legume from the seven variety of the forages. This is the Brachyria brisanta. Marandu, and this is very good feed in the dry seasons. So this is one of the best Barakiria variety, Barakiria hybrid mulatto. This is the Napier grass. It's very good feed, and but it need more management in terms of cutting, and also it need more fertile soil. So to expand the area, farmer most of farmer prefer to use the cuttings from the forages. So like the, from one bunch of the, the forage, they can have about four or five uh, cutting, so they can expand to a large area. Farmer Neng Lo Li and his wife have abandoned upland rice production altogether and now concentrate on growing a range of forages and legumes. Their animals have grown fat. <laughs> When I bought him, he was quite thin, but when I compare his body now, it's two or three times bigger. 
ลายฮับลายใจเทียนแน่นก้อนหน้าเทียนอ่ะยังบทันปุกอ่ะนะพุทธาชาพันธ์เนาะก้อนหน้าเทียนก็ไม่จะถือว่าแม่นในการทุ่งหญ้าก็ยังบทันนี่อย่างเลยเพราะว่ามีแต่พาลูกเมียไปถางป้าเฮ็ดให้เท่านั้นยังว่า What I did was take my wife and children to the fields. It was the only thing to do because of our hardship. When they came to the fields, they were able to buy some food. 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 In the last three or four years, I've been able to make some money and buy a few things like roofing materials. It's really improved our living standards. I bought a motorcycle and a video too. Who more to buy a video? After everything is sold, we have to reinvest some of the money. But we use the profits to buy clothes for our children and any left over to buy things we need. They eventually sold their buffalo for $980. There are many ways in which farmers are making money. Uh, the first one, obviously, is selling livestock. Later on, they might get into reproduction, producing their own. But that initial entry point is, is often to buy skinny and sell fat. <laughs> 